بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته All right, now here's a little bit of the problem. I don't like talking after we saw because I can't do the epic voice thing, all right? So while I'm talking, when I quote an ayah, it's not gonna sound epic. I'm just gonna quote, go ahead and quote it, okay? So you might not feel as excited, and I apologize, but some people are epic sounding, some people are epic looking, okay? <laughs> Okay, all right. Uh, all right. So to inshallah dial it back in, what we were talking about. We were talking about this beautiful, beautiful narration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this entire weekend has been dedicated under the shade to talking about this one tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know, I tell people, uh, I, I mentioned this when I lecture, even in my tafsir lectures. Uh, when Allah tells us about the life of the hereafter, when Allah tells us about paradise, when Allah tells us about the fire of hell, when Allah tells us about the day of judgment, I want you to understand the level of mercy that that is. How merciful that makes Allah. You know, when there's this, there's this big philosophical question that Muslims get asked and Muslim intellectuals are constantly dealing with. That the Quran talks about the fire of hell very very prominently. And what kind of a religion do you have? And it's so angry and it's so scary and it's so frightening and your God is so scary and He's frightening you. Allah telling us about the punishment in the fire of hell is actually an amazing form of Allah's mercy. It's kind of like a teacher or a parent, somebody that is responsible for your actions letting you know. That listen, I specifically do not want you to break this, break this jug. I do not want you to break the jug. Don't play with the jug. It's glass, you're a child, it will break if you mess with it, you play with it. If you toss it around. And if you end up breaking it, you will not get to play video games for two days. Now, that's, a, that's mercy. Because if the parent never even told you to begin with, don't play with the jug. How do you know you're not supposed to play with the jug? Or they said, don't play with the jug, but never bothered to tell you, well, what happens if I do play with it and I end up breaking it? They never told you what were the consequences. And then all of a sudden, they come and they snatch your video game away and they say, you're not playing video games. Now it feels like, oh my God, the oppression. Like, why are you doing this to me? Why do you hate me so much? But if I'm telling you, don't mess with it, don't play with it, because it will break, and then you won't have video games for two days, now I know exactly what I'm dealing with. And then if I still go ahead and choose to do it, then that's my own choice. The Prophet ﷺ, look at the level of mercy the Prophet ﷺ is displaying to us. The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him. He's telling us the day of judgment's coming, guys. And it's so severe that the sun will be right there above people's heads. And there will be no shade on that day where you can seek refuge and you can take shelter. Except for one shade, and that is the shade of Allah. And there are seven categories. And of course, Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, he mentions that there are other narrations, other ahadith. He has into actually an entire book dedicated to this. Al-Khisal, Al-Musila ila dhalal That the qualities that will take you all the way to the shade of the, uh, of the, of the, shade of the arsh of Allah. How, and however, nevertheless, this narration mentions seven categories of people. He's letting us know there are seven qualifications. There are seven different things that we are looking for. We have seven positions to fill. If you can fit the description, the qualifications that fit into any one of these seven positions or categories, you're guaranteed a place. You're guaranteed a spot. You got nothing to worry about. You can throw it on cruise control and just chill then. That's all that we're already being told. Everything's being told to you. There's no mystery. Like if you go for a job interview, a lot of you are college students. When you start going in for job interviews, it is nerve-wracking. It is the most nerve-wracking experience of your life. 
Because you know, everything you've done up to this point is for this right here. This is your future. This is make it or break it. And when you walk into that room, you don't know what they're going to ask you. You don't know what they're exactly looking for. What do they want to hear? What do they not want to hear? And it feels, it's really, really scary. But then guess what happens? Well, the guy that's going to be interviewing you, the guy who works with him or who works on his team is like your cousin's best friend. And he ends up calling you up and saying, hey, I heard you're coming in for an interview. Well, guess what? I work with that same team. Oh, my God, fantastic. And he tells you, look, this is exactly what he's going to ask you, and this is what, you, what they're looking for. If you t hit these points, boom, it's all taken care of. You got the job. What a hookup, right? And you'd walk into that room full of confidence. You'd sit down with a big smile from here to here on your face because you know you got this all figured out. The Prophet ﷺ gave it to us like that on the silver platter. He said, here, take it. That's what we've been talking about this entire weekend. And I had a few final thoughts here. What I was requested, the primary thing to touch on here in my session here was, you know, the topic was to shed a tear for the one we fear. With all due respect to the organizers, I would slightly adjust that a little bit. My talking point is the mercy of Allah. And I wouldn't, even though the fear of Allah is a component of our relationship, but that's not what I would stress here with you guys today. To shed a tear for the one that we love. To shed a tear for the one that we respect. To shed a tear for the one that we feel a sense of commitment to. To shed a tear for the one that we fear, we might have disappointed. That's what matters. That's, that's really what I want us to focus on here. And as you leave today's conference, and he talked to you about building that personal, private, intimate relationship with Allah. You know, we have two drastic spectrums of the Muslim community, particularly in the youth community. We have two opposite ends of the spectrum. I'm going to address both sides. The first side is the more religiously active youth. The active youth, all right? They're, they're involved with the MSA and they're uh, organizing the conferences. They're taking the seminars and the classes. They're doing all of this. For them, what I want to bring to your attention based on that last portion of the hadith was وَرَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيًّا And the, the person who remembers Allah free of any distractions, free of anyone around him, free of all the internal baggage that we're carrying, just connects individually one-on-one -on -one with Allah. What I want to address to the active youth is the need to have that private, intimate relationship with Allah. You can become so active, so active, so active that you forget to invest time into your own personal relationship with Allah. Serving humanity is, a, a, is the goal. It's what we need to do. But not at the expense of our personal relationship with Allah. That's why look at the five pillars of Islam. You find that balance there. After belief, what comes next? Salah. Salah is an individual act. Yes, there are certain, there's the element of congregational prayer. But it still allows for that personal reflection. Fasting. Everyone's doing it at the same time, but it's a personal experience. Alright? But then you've got charity. That's community. That's serving mankind, serving humanity, serving people. Your fellow brethren. And then there's the hajj, the communal experience of hajj. The collective experience of hajj. There's a balance. Activists, 90% of the time, tend to lose that sense of balance. Find time for just you and Allah. One of my teachers, when we were graduating, he shared, this love, he shared this piece of advice with us. And he said he was given this advice by his teacher, who was given this piece of advice by his teacher. And, it's a, and he said that his teacher told him, because he was telling me that he was mashallah also very good, he was a people person. He was good at working with people. He was good talking to people. He was a very, very dynamic speaker. So that naturally just kept involving him more and more and more in community work, in lecturing and talking and teaching and preaching, right? So he was constantly out there engaged with the people. And he said that his teacher took him aside. And he said his teacher was the very opposite type of scholar. 
The one that wasn't a very dynamic or prolific speaker. The one who wasn't, he wasn't like anti-social or anything. But he just didn't have a very outgoing personality. There are people like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But so he was the opposite type of scholar who was teaching a lot. He was always there to answer questions for people. He was doing a lot of research, writing books. And so he said he pulled them aside and he said, Abdullah, listen. Abdullah, listen. And he said the phrase in Urdu, and I'll just repeat it, but I'll tell you what it means. He said, Jesse Jalwat Bare Vesi Khalwat Bare. He said that as you continue to increase your public presence, as you continue to raise your voice and talk out and speak to the people, engage with the people, make sure that your intimacy with Allah also increases. If I'm working a lot more with the community, but I'm not also gradually increasing my time that I personally spend with Allah, whether that be in prayer, or that be in deep thought, or that be making dhikr, or that be reciting Qur'an, just sitting there and thinking, al muraqaba that's also an aspect of our religion and deen, and an aspect of our relationship with Allah. But find time for yourself and Allah alone. You got to. You have to. So that's the first thing for one side of one spe- side of the spectrum, the active, the active youth, the activists. For the other side of the spectrum, which is a good portion of our mu- youth community, they feel very threatened or very hesitant. They feel uncomfortable at the moment approaching and getting involved and. In being a part of the bigger scene of what's going on. They feel that things are either being defined for them. They feel that things are being shoved down their throat. They feel that they are being told to conform and to fit into a specific mold. They feel that this is a cookie, cookie cutter system. You want to take my individuality away. You want, me, you want to take my personality away. I'm my own person. I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not ready to just subject to some system that's telling me that i got to be exactly like this. And they, they feel some level of, they feel uncomfortable with that. And I'll tell you right now, for those youth that are listening, that fit into that category, I'll tell you right now, the reason you feel uncomfortable is because that's not what Islam wants from you. Islam, doesn't, Islam is not a cookie cutter system. Islam doesn't want you to be clones of each other. No, 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 no. The basis of Islam is again your private, personal, intimate relationship with Allah. And nobody, nobody, nobody can define that for you. No one can define that for you. It is your relationship with Allah. When Wissam just told this story about discovering tahajjud, that was, it it sounded like from from somebody who might know a traditional method of praying at night, that might sound like very, very weird and bizarre. But it's his personal relationship with Allah. It doesn't matter what I think of it. As long as it's valid in the eyes of Allah, as long as it's valid according to the principles that, that, that our beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he laid down and he taught us, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. So I want you to know that here today. Don't feel that you have to exactly fit in. But realize that what makes you Muslim is your relationship with Allah. And now let's talk about this. We keep talking about a relationship with Allah. But you, in order to love, you have to get to know the person, right? It's hard to love without knowing. You have to know, you have to be familiar. And that leads to love. Because that leads to admiration, which leads to love. So we need to get to know who are we dealing with? Who is Allah? And that's where this comes in. Who are we dealing with? We are dealing with the one who in surah number 39, ayah number 53, who tells us, he tells the Prophet ﷺ to proclaim, to announce, to say, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِ يَلْ يَا عِبَادِ O oh my slaves! He is having this proclamation made. O oh my slaves! Allah is calling out. Now which slaves is Allah talking to? The righteous, the pious, the scholars? No, no, no. الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ The ones who have wronged themselves. And the word for wrong is not just wrong, but crossing the line. أَسْرَفُوا إِسْرَاف They've crossed all lines against themselves. They are self-sabotaging, self-imploding. 
أسرفوا على أنفسهم they're harming themselves لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله do not ever 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 despair from the mercy of Allah don't you dare ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah this the, grammatically speaking this is called sighatu nahi this is the forbidding form of the word don't you dare it is forbidden for you to ever despair from the mercy of Allah we like wisam was saying we got a lot of talk in our communities about what's haram this is haram and that is haram and that is haram the haram we need to be talking about the haram we need to understand that comes first and foremost it is haram to lose hope in the mercy of Allah it is haram to despair from the mercy of Allah لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله. Why? إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا. Allah can and will forgive all the sins, all the sins. إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا. إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. Why? Because He and only He alone is the one who is constantly forgiving and constantly merciful. We as Muslims need to understand. We need to attach our hopes onto the mercy of Allah. We need to attach our hopes onto the mercy of Allah. And when you attach your hopes to something, right? When you are attached to like a balloon, how, how high you float or how high you fly up is going to be based on the strength of that balloon, the amount of air in that balloon, right? When we attach our hopes to the mercy of Allah, we need to understand the nature of the mercy of Allah. How, that, how carefree should, like in the sense of how confident it should make us, how much of a sense of security should it give us, how much love it should bring into our hearts for the one we're dealing with. The nature of the mercy of Allah, Allah tells us Himself in the Quran, in the rahmati wasi'at kulla shay. Most definitely, my mercy, it encompasses everything. Everything. That means the, the, greater, the greatest sin that you can commit, Allah's mercy is greater than that. The most horrible, despicable person you know, Allah's mercy is greater than that person's crime and than that person's evil. Allah's mercy encompasses, engulfs, takes over everything. In a hadith Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the Prophet sallallahu says that Allah has said, وَرَحْمَتِي سَبَقَتْ غَضَبِي in the rahmati sabaqat ghadabi. Most definitely my mercy, it supersedes. It overcomes my anger and my wrath. Allah's mercy is so available for us. The Prophet ﷺ tells us the manifestation or the access, the access door to the mercy of Allah is what we call tawbah, repentance, to turn back to Allah. The Prophet ﷺ gives us this beautiful analogy where he says that the door of tawbah is as vast as far as the distance from the east to the west. You know, when somebody has a past, what do we call that in our common language? They have, they have baggage. They have baggage. You know, if a door is narrow, I can walk through it. But then if, if I pick up two suitcases, can I walk through it anymore? I can't make, through, I can't make it through anymore because I got too much baggage. But it doesn't matter how much baggage you have. Because the door of Allah's mercy, Allah's forgiveness, and the door of repentance is, as, is bigger than any amount of baggage you might personally have. And then I'll, I'll, I'll end this point on a hadith Qudsi. Again, where the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah has said, Yabna Adam, O son of Adam, O human being. And this is a singular address. So Allah is talking to each and every single person individually. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna kama da'awtani wa rajawtani. As long as you continue to call out to me. He didn't say pray. Not even pray. As long as you continue to call out to me. As long as you have the capacity to just say, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, I need you. Inna da'awtani wa rajawtani. And you continue to have hope in my mercy. غَفَرْتُ لَكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي I will forgive you and I won't even mind. It's not even a big deal. Don't worry about it. He then goes on to say, يَبْنَ Adam, O human being, O each and every single person, لَوْ بَلَغَتْ ذُنُوبُكَ عَنَانَ السَّمَاءِ If your sins were to reach the limits of the sky, if your sins were to reach the limits of the sky, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an example. This is how my teacher explained this hadith to me. He said, 
I want you to imagine, for per, to, to explain it, to understand it. Every time you, one person, committed a sin, a cup appeared in this world. And then when he committed a second sin, a second cup appeared. And then when he committed a third sin, a third cup appeared. And so on and so forth. Till the point that this person kept committing sins, kept committing sins, kept committing sins. Till the point that the entire world, north, south, east, west, became completely, the earth became completely covered with cups. There was not a single inch left on the surface of the earth. The entire earth was full of cups. But then guess what? That person keeps sinning. And there's no more room on the earth. So where are we going to put the cups now? So he committed a sin again. And now you put it on top of the previous cup. And then it kept stacking on top of that. And this person kept committing sins to the point that eventually the entire world, all the way from the ground to the sky, became completely filled with cups. One person committed that many sins. One person. And then what does he say? And then after all that, thumma, then after all that, istaghfartani. You asked me for forgiveness once. You sincerely, honestly asked me for forgiveness once. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ghafartu laka wa la ubali. I will forgive you and I won't even mind. That's how merciful and forgiving Allah is. That is who we are dealing with. So I want you to take this, I want, I want you to really, really internalize this. This is a huge issue we are dealing with today. That is who our relationship is with. That is who we are dealing with. You know, a good friend of mine, a local native of yours, here from Chicago, Brother Abdurrahman Murphy, he was telling me about a situation, a story one time. He went to a community and he was talking to high school kids. And he said he was talking to these kids and it just kind of occurred to him. And he asked him, how many of you think that Allah is mad or angry with you right now? And he said, every single hand went up in the room. That is our perception of who Allah is. Where does the motivation and the inspiration come from then? This, this, wherever this mentality comes from, the Allahu A'lam, where, where you got being scared and feeling deprived keeps you motivated, it goes against everything psychology teaches us, and it goes against everything that the Qur'an teaches us, and it goes against everything that the Prophet ﷺ did. Making people feel loved, and know, letting people know that, they're, that they are welcome, and that they are being received into open arms, that is what motivates people. That is what drives people. And so know that that's who you're dealing with. The final note that I want to end with, is this second point. And again, I've been talking about balance, so I want to bring balance to my talk here with you today. And I'm going to end on this final point. A final observation about this entire hadith and all seven categories that we studied about over the span of the entire weekend. The just ruler, the young person who grew up, was raised in the worship of Allah, trying to please Allah. The person whose heart was constantly linked to the house of Allah. Two people who love each other for the sake of Allah, based on their relationship with Allah, and they join, they combine, they come together based on that, and they depart based on that. And a person who was called by a member of the opposite gender, who was very attractive and very appealing, the full package, all right? And then that person is able to resist that temptation solely based on their relationship with Allah and their cognizance and their awareness of Allah. And a person who gives whatever is within their capacity for the sake of Allah. And they protect it, they guard it, they save it. They don't use it as a means of showing off or celebrating themselves. And then finally a person who finds private intimate time to connect and build a relationship with his Lord Allah. These seven categories of people, you know what's very consistent throughout all seven categories of people? One thing, that, one thing that we can find consistent in all seven qualities or characteristics or traits is that you will have to keep, you will have to work hard at it. Not, 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 not that it's difficult, but you will have to work at it a little bit. 
You have to invest yourself into it. You know why? The just ruler. There will be times where his power and his control over those people that are his subordinates under his authority, his power is so absolute over them, he will have to catch himself and say, no, no, I could do it if I wanted to, but that didn't make it right. I got to do what's right. Or the subordinate will speak back or will, will insubordinate against him. And he has to have the, 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 the awareness of mind, the consciousness, the cognizance, not to retaliate. Not to attack, just because I have power and I have the upper hand. The second category, the young person has more distractions than any other demographic within our community. But that young person will continue to catch themselves and say, no, 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 I got to stay the course, I got to stay the course. This is just a distraction, this is just trying to, this is a speed bump, I just hit a speed bump, I got to keep going. That person who is trying to build a relationship with the masjid, with the house of Allah, he goes there, he's trying to build a relationship with the house of Allah and then some uncle yells at him and then some sister screams at her for not being covered properly according to the opinion of that sister. Now it is your responsibility to make sure that somebody else is not going to let not going to become a wedge between you and the house of Allah. No, 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 no. My relationship with this place is based on Allah. I could care less what that person has to say. They'll have to remind themselves. Two people whose relationship is based on Allah, well guess what, if your relationship is based on Allah, then when something petty, something trivial comes up between the two of you, then you gotta behave yourselves. Then you gotta behave yourselves. Because if you're true in your commitment that this relationship, this friendship is based on Allah, and the mutual love that we have for Allah, then you're not gonna let something petty make bad people out of you, you're not gonna misbehave. And then, of course, the temptation, the attraction, that sometimes it will become so severe that you actually stand there and start compromising, making excuses for yourself. But at the end of the day, I'm just a human being. How much am I supposed to resist? I'm just a human being. Or we'll get married later. Or whatever else the excuse or the compromise you might be making there with yourself at that time. No, you're going to catch yourself and you're going to say, No, I know what my Allah wants from me and I'm not going to engage in this because this will displease my Allah. And then, giving charity. Somebody else will give $100. A week after you gave $1,000. And they'll publish it in the newsletter. And they'll give it, present him with an award. And they'll thank him from the microphone. Or so one of your other friends will be like, Man, you know Abdullah? He's a super awesome guy. He gave a hundred dollars, man. MashaAllah, that brother's so generous. And you're sitting there and you gave a thousand dollars a week ago. And you're just thinking like, where's, where, where's, where's my props? Where's my pat on the back? When am I going to get some love? And you're going to want to say, yeah, mashallah, that's really good, but alhamdulillah, you know, brother, I dropped a grand on him last, last week. Mm. No, 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 I'm going to catch myself. I'm going to say, mashallah, good for you, good for brother Abdullah, good for everybody. Alhamdulillah. Because I know what I did, I did it for my Allah. And then like I was talking about earlier, I will make time for Allah. And then when I get up here on the microphone... And I'm talking and I'm doing a great job and then I'm getting invited to three other conferences and I'm hitting my stride and then again I start to convince myself this is my deen, this is, my, this is what I'm doing for the religion, this is why Allah will be pleased with me. That could be true. But again that does not preclude me from my, the necessity, the need that I have to still, after I'm done with this lecture, to go back up to my room when nobody else is in my room to clap and to say, Jazakallah, thank you very much, brother, great lecture. When nobody's there to say anything, then I sit down on the ground and I spread my hands before Allah and I say, Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. When I lay down in my bed and I think, you know, one day life's going to end and I'm going to have to lay down in a grave like this. Just like I'm lying here in my bed, in the comfort of my bed, one night I'll be lying in a grave like this. All and I'll be all by myself. I still got to do that. I still got to put my time in for that. Catching yourself, reminding yourself. And the last thing that I'll say here is this. These are seven categories. You guys are young people. I said this in my last couple of talks as well. You guys are young people. Your potential is limitless. 
The Prophet ﷺ said, People are gold and silver mines. You guys are worth more, worth more than gold and silver. You have so much potential. You are capable of so much. And your academic achievements and your involvement in the community and your activism is a testimony to that, mashallah. The number of relationships that you balance is a testament to that. I want you to make one commitment. Notice nowhere in the hadith did it say that you can fit into only one category. Did it say that anywhere? Did it say that one person can only fit one category? Did it say that anywhere, guys? Did you hear that at any time during the weekend? Yes or no? No. Strive to be the type of person who fits into every single category. Because you know what? There will be people like that on the Day of Judgment. And I'll end with this. I talked about heroes earlier this weekend. To look up to these amazing type of people. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. An amazing companion of the Prophet named Abu Bakr. May Allah be pleased with him. He was such an amazing and remarkable individual. He strove to always do, be the best and to do the best. And subhanAllah, there was one time during his lifetime when the Prophet ﷺ told him, Hani an laka ya Abu Bakr. Congratulations, O Abu Bakr. Congratulations, Abu Bakr. Inna lil jannati thamaniyatu abuab. Paradise has eight gates. Paradise, Jannah has eight gates. Wa anta tunada min kulli bab. And your name will be called out from all eight gates of paradise. Let's strive to be people like that because we're all capable of it. Jazakumullah khairan for your time and your patience. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.